What it do, what it do, guys. It's DeAnthony here, man, aka Hood Scout, back again for another edition of the Hood Scout Podcast. And this is really a unique podcast, a podcast like no other. We're going to have athletes, we're going to have coaches, we're going to have intellectuals, we're going to have media members of all sorts. And don't forget, guys, to like this podcast, share this podcast, and help grow this podcast. This is not just my podcast. This is also your podcast. And the only reason it's going to grow is because you guys are going to be invested in it, guys. Sit back, get your beverage of choice ready, get your popcorn ready, get your dinner ready, get your steak ready, get your vegan meal ready. Tune in, guys. Hood Scout. Peace. Hey, what it do, world? Welcome back to another edition of the Hood Scout podcast. Today, I got a got a great guest. Every time I'm looking up articles and that on College Ball, his articles pop up. Without further ado, tell the people who you are, brother, and where you're from. Uh, I'm Zach Barnett uh, from Football Scoop. Now, Zach, man, we can we can we can go so many directions with this. Um, man, I guess let, let, let's start formally. Where, where are you from? Where did you grow up? And, and kind of how was your introduction into the i don't know if you can say this sports media journalism type business yeah so uh i've been i guess i've i've grew up in the business i'm i'm from denton uh my dad did uh still does uh play by play uh oh, wow. did, did it for the san antonio spurs uh for the first part of my childhood then espn uh after that so i was you know grew up going to games uh you know wow. going to press boxes and was like you know I, I knew at an early age I didn't have the chops to do the, the live TV like he does, um, but I, the, the writing thing I could do. Um, yeah. I, I was always a decent writer, so I uh, went to college at the University of Texas and worked in the sports information department at that time. That was when uh, – that was the Colt McCoy years. Okay. So uh, we were really cooking then. Yeah. So I worked, for, worked in the, the SID just, just hanging around the football program as much as I could, and then um, – in college, I had an internship with the National Football Foundation, uh, based based locally in Las Colinas, and loved that work. It, absolutely loved it. You know, kind of the philanthropic arm of, of college football. Um, you know, keeps the history, runs the College Football Hall of Fame, uh, wow. runs the Campbell Trophy, which is you know the academic Heisman. So uh, it, it was fortunate enough to get a jo- call a job with them out of college. Uh, did that for two years, and then um, me and another guy were kind of uh, sharing, uh, uh, two jobs. And so he left and I took over his job. And so, uh, looking to stay there for a long time. And they were like, I knew, uh, once he left, I was probably going to get a, a, a decent raise. And, you know, if, if they'd given me, you know, I was making next to nothing there, but if they had given yeah. me a, a $10,000 raise, there's a good chance I'm still there today. They ended up giving me a $3,000 raise. And I was like, man, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, not going to make enough money to stay here. They don't, they don't value me. It, it, I probably need to go f- do something else. So that was on a Monday. And then on, uh, I think that was on a Friday. And then on a Monday football scoop posted that they were looking for, to hire someone. And, you know, this is a bad, uh, bad example for any job seekers out there, but I didn't apply to the job until Wednesday and wrote, mm-hmm. I was like, you probably already have someone, but here's who I am. Here's my situation. Here's what I'm looking to do. And then uh, Scott wrote back later that day and was like, I'm I'm interested in you. Uh, Let's talk. Uh, I interviewed with him that night and pretty much had the job uh, right then and there. And so that was about 10 years ago, 10 years ago this month, about 10 years ago. uh, It was right before the Texas U game 2012. So uh, that's been 10 years. uh, And I've since moved to Alito, had... um, you know, two more children, have three children now, and um, okay. it's been a great job for, for me and my family. Now, that's a lot to unpack there, Zach, that I didn't know. That's why I always love these episodes, because on social media, you only, a lot of times, only know one facet of a person unless you really know them. So, to a two-parter, how was it growing up with a dad that does that? Because not every not every kid gets experienced that. I mean, you know, you're going to games, you're seeing your daddy, you know, doing what he does. How did that impact you? What you know? What type of lessons did you learn? And then, how was it around that Texas program during that that, that Colt area, Colt McCoy area? Like, what did you know? How was that experience like for you? Uh, I'll take the first part first. It was, you know, it was great. Uh, you know, getting to go to to games and stuff, which you know didn't happen all that often. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he when he was this, he, we went to just about all the home games we needed. Did the Spurs, but then when 
he was with ESPN. He was traveling a lot more. So, you know, we'd go to one or two a year. Um, okay. and, and that was great. Um, but at the same time, it was, there, were, there were parts of it that were hard because, you know, he'd be gone, you know, college basketball season. It seemed like he was gone the entire month of February. So it was just me and my mom and my sister at home. So th- there were tough moments. And when I was uh, when I was younger, I didn't really understand why I had to be gone so much. And as I got older, I understood it. But um, overall, it was it was it was a great a great upbringing, great great childhood, but not without its warts. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you know, going to UT, you know, it's so Mac Brown got the got there when I was ten, which was right when oh, I was uh, coming of age. Yeah. And so pretty much all I knew was Texas being a top 10 program. And you, yeah, they won the national championship my senior year of high school. Um, I, I didn't get in right out of school, so I didn't show up till my sophomore year. But I mean, they were top five, you know, a, a season outside the top five was an abomination. And mm-hmm. so yeah. uh, they, you know, we were right there on the cusp in 2008, 2009, I graduated and like, well, it's always going to continue this way because it's always been that way. You know, yeah. you understand that the '90s weren't that great, but that was that was prehistory. That was before I came around. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, since then, now we are. Uh, this is what this is the 13th season since I graduated high school, and we're still or graduated college, and we're still looking to to return to uh, where we were. And you're know, recording this Monday after the Oklahoma State loss. Yeah. Another, <laughs> another, uh, setback, and the the journey continues. You know, and let me say this, and I wasn't going here, but, you know, you got to go where it goes. Um, now, I see, I think I'm a little bit younger than you, but, but I, I remember the championship era, but I remember that Mac era where it was like, this team is underachieving. That was early in that Mac Brown era. It's like, why are we having a tough game against the Colorado when they had Chris Brown or against Nebraska when they had some decent teams? And then Mac finally broke through. But let, 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 let's, let's talk about Texas right now. What? I'm just gonna ask you a question. What is wrong with Texas? I you know, I grew up watching them back from, from the Nathan Vasters to man, so many Earl Tom. I mean, just so many of the great players. It seemed like what's missing, man. You know, you hear so much about culture and you know, it seemed like they're changing cultures, coaches every two or three years. What do you think is a problem with Texas? Or is it a problem? Um, you know, I think you know, I, I'm gonna say this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna couch it with the with the uh, asterisk that if you'd asked me this question in 2019, I would have given you the exact same answer, even though we know it wasn't the case. So uh, maybe in 2026, I'll look back at this answer and be like, no, you fool, you were wrong. But <laughs> having said that, I think they are on the way back to being there. Uh, I, I think it's without a doubt, at least offensively, players win games. They have better players than they've had. Yeah. Since, since since the salad days of the Mac Brown era, now yeah. why why have they struggled so much? I think it, that's a, a chicken and egg question that no one really has the answer to. Although we see the end mm-hmm. result, it's mm-hmm. are they not getting the right guys, or are they getting the right guys and not coaching them up the right way? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you this past game was a a great example because Oklahoma State, you know, Texas has a more talented roster than Oklahoma State, even when Oklahoma mm-hmm. State was at full strength. And Oklahoma yep. State wasn't even close to full strength. They were down, I think, five starters. And that mm-hmm. doesn't even count guys like Spencer Sanders that probably could have sat that game out if you wanted to. Yep. You know, Texas was close to full strength going into that game. And Oklahoma State was down 17 or down 14 and still found a way to win. Uh, it's yeah. just they don't have – they even as much as they've worked on it, they're, that – you know that that culture that that mindset yeah. of we're going to find a way to win this game no matter what it takes and you know mm-hmm. we, you and i were talking uh off air about the alito didn't ryan game uh mm-hmm. you know i was i was at that game friday night and um sitting right behind right behind the bench we were sitting two rows behind the alito bench and it was great soaking it in because alito was down seven nothing early and alito doesn't trail mm-hmm. often and then got up 21 7 and then ryan came back and tied the game 21 21 you're on the mm-hmm. road. It's tied. You don't have momentum. And you could just sense it. Like, we're going to win this game. We're going to do what it takes to win this game. Yep. And they came back and won the game 35-21. And, I mean, it's been that way. You know, they've won 10 state championships. They've oh. got a proud history going back long before that. So it's like, mm-hmm. this is what we do. We're going to win games. Mm-hmm. We're going to find a way to win this game. And Texas just doesn't have that. When when doubt creeps into their mind, they're not. they just haven't been able to defeat that doubt 
And, you know, they, they won that Iowa State game last week. But when it got tough on the road, you know, it's Oklahoma State was thinking we're going to find a way to win this game. And Texas was new in their mind. We're going to find a way to lose this game. And both both sides were proven correct. And I got to give a lot of respect to Oklahoma State. I thought they played very tough. Spencer Sanderman, he was getting hit. He was getting hit hard. Mm-hmm. And that kid is tough as nails. And, you know, it, it's very interesting, that because, I, you know, I've heard a lot of coaches tell me this, and I, I have a philosophy that I believe is, is true as well, how teams take on the person, the, the persona or the kind of the head coach. So it, 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 now Texas is a complex beast because of so many factors. You know, you hear the rumors of the boosters are too involved, and I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea. But do you think at all this is a case where – But I mean, it's three head coaches, but is it a matter of this team taking the culture of the head coach and, that, and, 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 and maybe that's – they didn't have – they don't have the right guy all these years? Or could it not be since you've had literally three head coaches – within this span of, I would say, at least a decade? Uh, I think Charlie Strong was just the wrong hire. Uh, okay. he, he, he did great things at Louisville. He was the right guy for Louisville. He was not the right guy for Texas. So, mm-hmm. you know, if it, he three-year tenure was the shortest by a Texas coach in a long time, but if you'd given him six, seven, eight years, I don't think he was ever going to get it turned around. You know, Tom Herman, I would have I would have sat here on this podcast in 2016 and said, I will stake my credibility on Tom Herman. <laughs> being successful at Texas and I would too. Yeah. I mean, I I guess in a way I was kind of right because he's been since 2010, he's produced arguably the two best seasons by uh, in 2018, 2019, 2020, they were pretty good those years, you know, they Mm -hmm. were top 20 team. So I wasn't all the way wrong, but uh, you know, he just, you know, personality wise, people didn't want to work for him. People didn't want to play for him. So he had to go. And so, uh, you know, Sark, I, I think people like his personality. He's recruited really mm-hmm. darn well. But the question is, is he that great of a head coach? You know, yeah, USC know. was up and down. Washington, you know, he did, Washington was terrible when he got there. And he yeah. turned around pretty quickly. But then mm-hmm. they plateaued at 7-5. and five, And the, the question still remains, is he just a 7-5 and five head coach? You know, he's, I think, 5-5 five and five in Big 12 games where he holds a lead in the second half. And he's, I think, three and seven in in one score games, mm-hmm. and so you you go up against a Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy's had a long time to win those games. He's he's mm-hmm. the the elder statesman of Big Twelve head coaches. So he's he's been in a lot of battles and won a lot of battles. So you know we could boil it down to a lot of different factors of why they lost that game. It could just be that Mike Gundy's had a lot more experience in those games than Sark has, and give him time, he'll get there. It could just be mm-hmm. that. You know, Spencer Sanders is a fourth-year starting quarterback. Quinn Ewers is basically a true freshman playing his first road game in a tough environment. The wind was swirling. You know, maybe if you, if they play that game again in uh, in calm conditions, maybe Texas wins going away. We don't know. But yeah. the, the fact of the matter is Oklahoma State found a way to win that game in those conditions, and Texas found a way to lose it. Now, high side 2020, and I like Sark, especially as a person, and I remember those USC days as a as a, I think it was an OC or quarterback coach, one of those. Let me ask you this, but going back with, with that hiring process a few years back with Texas, did you have a candidate that you was most most fond of? Um, I think the the probably the people's candidate was was Jeff Trailer, uh, who's a guy mm. you'll be familiar with. Everyone in, in that's even remotely familiar with Texas high school football is familiar with him. I mean, mm-hmm. because the guy's just a winner. He won at Gilmer. He's winning at UTSA. You know, this past mm-hmm. Saturday, they really probably had no business beating North Texas. Yeah. Very, very similar game to the one that played out in Stillwater where UTSA was very banged up. They were at home and they were down, drove late to win the game because, you know, they had a winner at, at head coach. Not not to throw any shade at, at Seth Luttrell, who's, you know, great dude, great head coach. But Jeff Trailer just wins games, and he had a Frank Harris is a dude at quarterback, and they found yeah, him yeah. in those games. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I, I I thought then, still believe now even more strongly that if Sark's not the guy, it'll it'll be a short search down, you know, be an hour fifteen search down to get Jeff Trailer at at UTSA because the guy just just wins football games. So he was kind of really the only guy, and at that time, uh, coming off twenty twenty, he'd only been there one season. And it mm-hmm. would have been an extremely tough sell. So um, it, it was pretty much going to be 
Sark the guy because this this was a an off books search, so to speak. They they had Sark wrapped up before Herman was even let go. Mm, yeah, yeah. Wow. Now you know a lot of, a lot of people wanted Urban. Now this was this was pre the issues at, at Jacksonville, but a lot of people wanted Urban. I was on that bandwagon because to me he was a winner. Um, but I mean the Candace was just it, it was a tough thing. I thought Dan Muller, but I'm like, can he win? Can he sustain winning? I mean, to me, they didn't have a lot of great choices out there. Yeah. And go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I was sorry to interrupt, but I, I was uh, I was following that that storyline, uh, you know, very quietly, uh, you know, as that season was going along. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's funny because Quinn Ewers, you know, his history at Texas is so fascinating considering he's played mm -hmm. like two complete games at this point. But Tom Herman was fired the moment Quinn Ewers decommitted. I mean, that was the ultimate – Voter yeah. confidence. Herman was done mm -hmm. the moment he was decommitted, and so yeah, I I, I was following the the urban situation, and mm -hmm. I could I, I knew pretty quickly that that wasn't going to happen because Urban's a guy who, you know, he's got his guys, and he wasn't at, at that stage of his career he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna start anew, and so you know Mickey Mirati, his his longtime strength guy Mark Cantoni, his uh, his uh, personnel guy. Those guys were entrenched at Ohio State, and they they were with Ryan Day and, and loving life with Ryan Day. Because when you work with Urban, it's like it's like fourth and one in the college football playoff every single day. And so, Ooh, he, he oh well, no, 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 Zach. See, this is why I gotta ask because you you got this intel where the listeners don't, and, and I don't even. What do you mean by that? It's just where every single day and every every recruit, every detail is a hundred percent. We have to get this. Or everything's going to fall apart. We're going to we're going to lose. We're going to get fired. Like it is just intense, 365 days a year. And so wow. when you're in there and you're you're climbing for national championships, you can live that way. But uh, I mean, when when you're Urban Meyer, he makes it work for him. But uh, you know, the Pantones, the the Maratis, guys like that. You know, Urban's lieutenants, Urban's guys. They were entrenched at Ohio State and working for Ryan Day. And Ryan Day's not that way. And so, um, you know, they, they weren't going to leave Ohio State. You know, they weren't going to uproot their lives to go work for Urban at Texas. That, that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So once I once I figured that out, I was like, Urban's not going to take this job. He's not going to he's not going to go in there without his guys ready to go. So uh, and, you know, go back to Tom Herman. I think Tom Herman tried to be that way. And yeah. I think it just wore on people. I think it wore on the players. Mm -hmm. I think it wore on his assistants. It certainly wore on boosters. And so. Um, at that point, he was done. You know, Urban's way works for Urban and only Urban. And you got to win with it, too, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you do that to Herman and you win eight or nine games, it's like, ah. And then you win 11, it's like, okay, that may work. So you exactly. got to win when it solves all. Exactly. So Urban, he – he, and I've kind of seen this, too, but he's a guy that he wanted that core there, that whether it's that strength coach, kind of lieutenant. I, thought, I like that word you use. He's a guy – so are these guys he's worked with for many years at – Multiple colleges or these guys that were just with him at Ohio State? Um, so Pantone was with him at Florida. Uh, I, I think if I had uh, – I might be mistaken here, but I believe Pantone was like an undergrad at Florida. And, um, you know, he basically invented the modern, uh, you know, player personnel director position. And uh, because, you know, for, for years and years and years – the recruiting coordinator was just a, a coach on staff who, who okay. did that in addition to his job. And so Pantone has probably more than any other individual done more to professionalize, you know, the recruiting personnel side of the business and turn it into more of a, a true front office NFL type position. He's done more of that than anybody else. So he's, he was a Florida guy. Uh, Marathi, I think was a Florida guy. Uh, you know, Corey Dennis, was Urban's quarterbacks guy. I think he went with him to Jacksonville, if I'm not mistaken. But he's yeah, Urban's I feel like he long. Did. So okay. he he's had a lot of guys that had been with him. You know, uh, he had Larry Johnson, who's you know the yeah. the dean of all D line coaches in college football. Yeah. Um, Tony Alford, you know, one of, maybe the best running backs coach in college yeah. football. Just guys that I think if if those guys had come with him to Texas, Urban would have taken the job. But they weren't they weren't leaving Ohio State, and they weren't going to go work for Urban again. Is now Zach, is that normal for now Urban's a winner, obviously, and and and, and would probably with my opinion be a Hall of Fame college coach. Do those guys typically have their core already ready if they get a new job, or is it one of them things where it's just we just never know? Like 
you know, a guy like, like for instance, Lincoln Riley going to uh, USC. Obviously, he took a few of his guys that were with him at Oklahoma. So is it normal to have that core when you get that new job, or is it just based on does guys want to go? Do you, do you kind of get my question? Yeah. So for the yeah, you, you do certainly have have your core, your core guys, and um, because to, to a head coach is only as strong as the staff. So if you're trying to start from scratch in a new job, chances are you're not going to be successful. Now, having mm-hmm. said that, we've seen a lot of examples of guys you know, moving up a level and wanting to bring their entire staff with them. And that doesn't work either. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's another chicken and egg situation where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta take the guys that you're comfortable with the guys that got you that job. And, you know, it can be a tough, it can be a tough situation where, Hey guys, you know, thanks for helping me get this job. I'm going to double my money work, you know, be on TV every week, but you guys aren't coming <laughs> with me. So that, yeah. that's a tough situation. I mean, look at it at Auburn right now. Uh, Brian Harson was kind of caught in between where he hired uh, Derek Mason to coach his defense and Mike Bobo, you know, Mike Bobo has been a long time SEC guy to run his offense. Yep. Uh, they were SEC guys, but they weren't Brian Harson guys and they wow. didn't mesh well at all. He's uh, you know, they were both gone after a year by extremely mm-hmm. mutual decision. Uh, and then uh, Brian Harson tried to go out and hire a different coordinator uh, who's uh, I should know his name. But uh, name escapes me right now. He's with Austin Davis, Southern okay. quarterback, was with the Seahawks, had never worked in college before. He hired him. Austin Davis in like six weeks is like, college football is not for me. I'm out of here. So then he went in and promoted Eric Keesaw, who was his coordinator at Boise, who came with him. And uh, Jeff Schmetting was his defensive coordinator at Boise. Both those guys came with him to Auburn as position coaches. And then now in year two, he promoted them to head co- or to, to coordinator. He was like, these are my guys. You know, the, you know, we, we work in lockstep. And now it looks like all three of those guys are about to be put on the street because it, it looks it certainly looks like Brian Harson's not going to get a year three at Auburn. So he tried to, to kind of have it both ways by bringing his yeah. guys with him while hiring new from the outside. And it, that didn't work either. So. There's really not – it depends on the guy, and there's really not, not a right or wrong answer to it. Now, now, Zach, what is what is this thing with Harson? Now, is that not personal, but, you know, we know Auburn last year. Well, they, I don't know if that – were they last year? I'll see this. I don't know. Stuff started going. You forget timelines. But, you know, were they going to fire him? Were they going to keep him? Uh, I was talking to a coach that actually worked on his staff at Boise State on a lower level, but – what is it with Harson that is it kind of a personality thing? Is it a philosophy thing? From what you can hear, what is that kind of I don't want to say riff, but I will say that. What is the riff there with with, with Harson and I guess that Auburn program in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely it starts with personality and philosophy. Uh, you know, right. Auburn is a place where when you talk about boosters, it Auburn boosters seem like they have the, you know, more of an influence there than maybe anyone else in college football. And I think being stuck between Alabama and Georgia, I think, you know, they're the only team in college football that has to play those two every single year. So I think that kind of makes them a little bit insane because <laughs> they want to win like those programs, but they, yeah, you know, on one hand, they don't have the resources of an Auburn or, or Alabama or Georgia and just, and that they're not the, the state schools. But then at the same time, you go back and every single coach up in, I think their last four coaches before Harson have either, gone undefeated or won a national championship or played for a national championship. Gus did it. Mm-hmm. Chiswick did it. Tuberville went undefeated. Even uh, Terry Bowden went undefeated. So mm-hmm. they they have periods of incredible success and then very deep valleys where it can get bad and it can get bad real quick on them. So mm-hmm. I think that makes it makes them a little bit in, in, insane in a, in a sense. And so you bring in a, just a, an extreme outsider in Brian Harson who uh, – you know, he's a, you know, very much a, a strong head coach mentality in that let me, you know, get out of the way, let, let me do the job, let me run things. Coming from a, you know, a, a program in Boise where they had a distinct culture that he was a part of as a player, a, you know, a, a position coach and a coordinator. I think mm-hmm. it was just, it was just changing of such, trying to meld such different worlds. And then, you know, yeah. you, that was manifested a bit in his coordinator hires and his, uh, assistant coaching hires and it was just got off on the wrong foot and he's been uh you know dancing with two left feet ever since 
Yeah. <laughs> 20 more, 24 minutes in, talking with, a, I would consider him a journalist, a, a, a Zach Barnett. Um, really just flowing, and I'm grateful for his time. Zach, let's talk a little bit about this college football system. Uh, you, you, you used, uh, I think we were talking about Urban's lieutenants. We kind of talked about kind of that, that their college football taking that NFL model, that front office model. Man, college football now is, is almost like professional sports, and I use the word almost. Well, what do you know about, you know, the staff? It seems like staff has gotten bigger. Uh, the money got a little bit better. Um, you know, I think saving his staff, he has such a big staff. That seems to be the norm with these great programs. How is this thing built? Zach, is college ball similar to the NFL now with, with, with the model? You know, every, all these people on staff, you know, you got the nutrition, you got – it's kind of becoming to me like a machine. I remember talking to a coach at Michigan State, and I didn't know they were going to have a bad year, but I was saying I thought Tucker was building a type of machine there with a lot of the money and the resources. What was this college thing? Is it kind of coming like professional with the resources, the money, and, and all the hand, hands-on power? Even read an article a couple of years ago about coaches using private jets and airplanes to recruit. What is this thing? What is college sports, Zach? I mean, talk to me a little bit about it. Yeah, so I think, you know, I like to say college football is an inherently American enterprise, kind of like the, the, you know, the U.S. Constitution. You know, mm -hmm. the United States, we've helped set up uh, governments and democracies in a lot of different countries across the globe. But when we export democracy, the Constitution doesn't come with us. It's such a uniquely <laughs> American yeah. uh, document that to duplicate it, you couldn't, no one else could really do it and you wouldn't really want to. It's just so complex. Mm -hmm. And college football is kind of that way because mm -hmm. you have this system where it's professional for everyone but the players. And uh, it, it's big time and small time at the same time. And <laughs> you have a lot of different constituencies and you have presidents. The, the ultimate people who make the call are college presidents who don't mm -hmm. really, aren't really football people don't really care that much about football. You know, they have a lot other things, a lot bigger things to do on their mind. But at the same time, they're the people who call the shots at college football. And there's no one person out there who's looking out for the best interest of the sport. Everyone's in it, you know, best interest of their constituents and them, themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from that way, it, it makes a lot more sense and it, it starts to make sense. And so mm -hmm. the, the staff thing, you know, there, there's 10 full-time assistant coaches that can – coach on the field and go on the road to recruit. And, you know, here later this year, early next year, the NCAA is about to change that rule yep. to where, uh, you know, they're, they're going to increase the number of, of countable coaches that, that can coach yep. players on the field and go on the road. And so I think that's going to make things a lot more wild westy, but at the same time more manageable for coaches because right. you can have guys that, that pretty much are just, uh, you know, major league, you know, NFL style talent scouts that just go on the road and, and recruit. You've got, uh, you know, I think Washington state, but I believe it has a, a guy on staff there whose full title is just director of transfer recruiting. And, you know, his job is basically just to be a, a pro personnel director and, you know, monitor, monitor the portal monitor uh, and see what's out there that can fit Washington state's needs. And the way the system is set up to where, the, the system is set up to where you're kind of – it kind of makes more sense to go after a transfer at this point than a high school recruit because a transfer mm -hmm. is more committed to you than a high school recruit because he's already used his one-time waiver and he'd mm -hmm. have to jump through more hoops to leave you. It's not to say it's impossible, but he'd have to jump through a little bit more hoops to leave you where you sign a guy out of high school, he has a bad day, he can, he can portal and he's gone and there's not a whole lot you can do to stop him. So it's – it's a situation where because the players are not professionals, there's limits on, you know, the NCAA has argued for years and years and years in court that these guys are just nothing more than traditional students that happen to do mm -hmm. an extracurricular curricular activity. And so because of that, well, any other, any other student, you and I can transfer colleges without, you know, using our eligibility. So mm -hmm. now, athletes have to have, can transfer without using their eligibility. So if, if, if college athletes were professionalized, I think you or were professionals, then you'd see a lot. The portal would be tamped down a lot, but it's just, there's so little regulation that it's, 
the system kind of runs itself. There's no one person in charge. Now, Zach, is is there a – what? because I know you've been around this college game. What teams have some of the larger staffs? Like, I, I know Alabama's kind of known for that big staff. I think Michigan State had quite a few. Uh, Florida got quite a few. Who are, And I don't know if it's the same across the board. I'm imagining it's not because I'm sure resources have to play into it. But who are some of the teams with some of the bigger staffs you've seen? And is there a correlation between kind of that – that? Well, and I'm talking off the field as well, that, off, that, that big staff and winning? Is that type of correlation of that? And is there a correlation between – the more money you have as a program, the bigger your staff is. Uh, I mean, I, I, certainly the more money you have, the bigger your staff is. You know, Alabama, it's it's tough to – it's honestly tough to get a hold, uh, an exact count on how many people um, Alabama has because they don't list them on their website. They don't list them in their okay. media guide. They got a lot of guys who are just there. And who, right. Now, and you can tell that there when you're watching the game. You're like, who is that guy? Yeah. Yeah, and so you know, Florida, Florida made headlines for uh, they had more hundred and something players, and more than that, you know, people in polos that are on staff. A, a lot of those people were, uh, you know, student trainers and, and undergraduate right. people that just volunteer. So it wasn't quite that big, but Florida certainly has uh, uh, beefed up it, its staff. And so the question of money is, you know, the, they've done a lot of there's there's been a lot of studies of just pouring money into your facilities help you recruit better players because ostensibly that's why you're doing it is to recruit better players. And it's kind of a yes and no. Uh, You simply building a new building is not necessarily going to get you better players, but the, Mm -hmm. because whatever building you've built, all the schools you're recruiting against have built that same building, have refurbished their locker room, just like you have. So the question is, if you don't do that, will it hurt you? Will it cost you recruits? And the question, the answer to that is yes. You know, Mm -hmm. players go where the players want to go, where they, they, they can develop and and become NFL players. That's always going to be the number one sell in recruiting is NFL opportunity. So if you have 20 staff members, will, will go growing to 25 or 30, will that make you win on its own? No, mm-hmm. probably not. But if your mm-hmm. if your competitors have thirty staff members and you stay at twenty, will you lose because of that? Yeah, most likely you will. So mm-hmm. that long story short, I think that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I'm, I'm oh 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 hit the hit the hit the hit the hit the hit the, hit the uh hit the podium. Thank you. Now, do you you know nil? You know that's a big deal now, and I'm I'm fra- I'm kind of framing this like this TCU, which. You know, I'm, let me say this too. You know, it's so funny. You consider TCU a smaller school, but I think, and I don't know the numbers, and it's kind of your area because you like these numbers and articles. I feel like TCU, from a financial standpoint, is not not a bad school. Is that correct? And TCU, one of the high grossing schools economically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, uh, the point. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We just make sixty four thousand dollars sticker price per year. To yeah. In there, so money the, is the, not the, so, TCU. Yeah, so, but I brought TCU up because. To, to me, I look at them like a smaller school. They're they're doing well in the Big Twelve. Uh, in this era of NIL, big staff sizes, and kind of making this thing like a pro model, how do how are those teams like TCU and there's only a few other ones that are small, Cincinnati out there in there, able to maintain that consistency? The TCU been kind of up and down the last few years. Let's be honest, but how are they able to do it? as quote unquote slightly smaller schools and I'm using that in quotation obviously. Well I think Sonny Dykes has been really smart about building his staff and building his roster. Uh he's TCU is you know he did this at SMU and TCU mm-hmm. is even more uniquely positioned uh yep. to go out and get guys that you know because they're in the Metroplex, there's a lot of a lot of dudes in the Metroplex. Now yep. a lot of these guys uh will sign with power five schools elsewhere and mm-hmm. then things don't work out for them at that location for whatever reason. And then when they look to transfer, the first place they're going to look is to go back home uh, because you know, portal recruiting is very, very different than high school recruiting. It's a much more of an NFL free agency. It's very much business related and it's where am I going to, you know, I, I, I've, I've done the, you know, the official visit, the dog and, so uh, 
any so I think any school in a in a metro area is going to do well uh, these days because it's going to be home to a lot of a lot of players that may maybe sign with an Oklahoma or an Ohio State at a high school that you know aren't playing or are looking to to go out and get NFL tape get mm-hmm. get some something on tape so they can play in the NFL and then if you look at you know. If you can start TCU, there's going to be more NIL opportunities than if you were in Waco or Lubbock or Stillwater. I mean, Ooh. there's just you're just in a lot bigger a lot bigger market than that. So, I think Sonny's done a very good job. He's a, he's a great coach for TCU, and, and TCU is a great spot for him. And uh, and then I, I think the other thing with NIL. Uh, a lot of people said, "Oh, you know, Alabama, Ohio State—they're just going to get their recruit even better than they already did." And yep. you know, Texas A&M is a, a you know has done recruited well before; they're recruiting better now. But at the end of the day, there's only one football. There's only 22 spots on the field. So- Thank you for coming on. Um, and enjoy your day. And let, let let's see if we can do part two really soon. Let's let's do that. And uh, AT and T, be better next time. Okay. Take care, bro.